chapter 25 in Acts. We're going to get there in just a second. Let me tell you a couple things. One, for those who don't know me, my name is Rich, and uh, it's an exciting time to be alive, right? Uh, amen. Um, next week, back to school blessing. So um, the kids are bummed and the parents are joyful at sending the kids back, right? Your budget's just going to go down in the food department probably. It's going to be amazing. And um, we want to pray for these guys. They're going into, in what is a lot of cases, what I consider a hostile environment. An environment that wants to see their souls destroyed. Um, not in every case, but in some. So we're going to pray not just for the kids, but for our administrators, for our teachers, for our custodians. Uh, anybody that is on campus, because we want God to send your children godly people who will come alongside of them and inject truth into their life and help direct them on the path of righteousness. So let me just get here next week. And by the way, that's a great time to invite people. Maybe your neighbor has 27 kids and they want them blessed. And so that's a great time to just invite them over. Uh, my, my wife's not in here today, but I did want to tell her happy 20th anniversary today. Yeah. Yeah, she's a good one. Yeah. She's a good one, and um, we're going to celebrate. Don't worry about that. It'll be good. Acts chapter 25, we've been in this uh, crazy journey, right? It's hard to believe we're going to finish 25 today, Lord willing, and then we're going to have three chapters in Acts left, and it's going to be incredible, and we're going to be on to the next thing, studying the Word of God. I want to talk a little bit just kind of to jump in here about the softening of society. Society is getting softer in a lot of ways, and people... Like we said it last week, are quick to be offended. Yeah, very quick. Super offended, super fast. Um, people are very fast to quit something. Like, you hurt my feelings, I quit. Job got hard, I quit. Right? No, no plan B, just quit. Some of you have had people just walk off the job. Got upset, just walk off. And you're like, wow. And that starts a chain reaction in life if you don't have a plan B. And it can be really challenging. So I want to talk a, a little bit about determination, not a lot about it, but a little bit, because I think that's going to be a big factor for us in the next season, right? We, had a, we always get a chance to preach Jesus. And here at LifePoint Church, if you're new here and you're wondering, like, what's all this place about? Um, you know, Augustine was up here, just, we're just a bunch of regular people who love Jesus, right? We're trying to live that out. We don't necessarily preach a system of behaviors, now, I want to carefully unpack that just for a second because there are some behaviors that come with this. But we don't preach a system of behaviors. We preach the love of Christ, right? And he loved us first, and so we love him. And out of a place and a heart of love for Jesus, behaviors should follow. If you're walking around saying, I love Jesus with all my heart, with all my strength, with all my soul, with all my mind, and you're acting like a crazy person all week long, Something doesn't match up, and so we, we have to, you know, change what we're doing and let God speak through us. We love Jesus, and out of a loving heart for our Savior should flow obedience. You don't have to come to church. You get to come to church. You don't have to give, right? The Lord can take care of himself. You get to give. You don't have to serve. You don't have to, except that Jesus said, we are to be servants, right? We serve, not be served. And so when that happens, the, the heart that really loves God, all my heart, all my soul, all my strength, in the New Testament, Jesus added all my mind, right? If, if that happens, then something will change in our lives from a, a life of craziness, a life of sin, a self-serving life to a life of holiness, a life that wants to honor the Lord, and maybe we've been good at that, maybe we haven't. And so as we continue the journey of Paul's story, his defense over the last couple of chapters, last week we said he cheerfully made his defense, it, it, it keeps getting pushed down the line. And we know the Roman authorities have not done a great job of just finishing this. But what's happened is they just uh, I don't want to deal with it. Politics, 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 and they keep pushing it down the line. And hey, you deal with it. Tribune said you deal with it. And, and Felix, and Felix to Festus today, and Festus to Agrippa, and Agrippa to Caesar. And uh, that's, this is how it goes. But there's this, this question that I was thinking about all week long, and it's really this. Are we guilty or not? Now look at Paul, because he really stood innocent against the accusations that were against him over the last couple chapters. But he was, certainly was guilty of something. 
it was guilty of something, and that's living for the Lord. Are you guilty of that? Are you guilty of living for yourself? Are you guilty of crimes in our society? Some of you have stood before courts and before juries and have experienced what that's like. Well, Paul's re repeatedly experienced that over the last couple of weeks, and I want to make sure that if we're guilty of anything today, it is honoring the Lord with our life. I want to make sure of that when we leave here today, that that is it, church. Paul is so passionate. He is such a passionate guy, and while passion is amazing and will help you do some wild things, it really will. I know some of you are just gym fanatics. You are passionate about working out, and there's not a lot that will keep you from working out. You're going to get the, you, some of you getting up and at like 3.30, 4 o'clock in the morning to work out. I'm like, wow, that is wild behavior to me. You know what I mean? <laughs> like I'll get up at 3 o'clock in the morning to pray, spiritually work out, but to go run on a treadmill, no thank you. Um, I'm not passionate about that. I'm passionate about some other things. Some of you are passionate for some things, and some of you are passionate for somebody. Right? That, that happens. You, some of you have been long-distance relationships, and you've, you know, driven to Jacksonville every weekend for like a year because you're passionate about that person and you know you will find a way but more important than passion and certainly in the, the life of Paul and us too is is the filling of the Holy Spirit right that we would operate in the filling that we would live a spirit-led life because passion eventually might wear out it might Holy Spirit power will never run out it's infinite. There's always enough for you, and there's always more for today and more for tomorrow if you will live that way. So if you're passionate about something, awesome. You should be passionate about God, of course, and you can stick it out in, a, in, in the long run. You may be able to go a little longer, but will you be able to stand firm? Will your, will your backbone be concrete? Will you be anchored in Hebrews that, that Jesus is an anchor for our soul? Will you be able to stand it? Now, Paul knew he was innocent before man. He says it. He said it over and over again. He'll say it again today. So when the trial comes at his hands, he's innocent. He said, I want to go to Caesar and talk about this. And here's what Paul knew that these guys didn't know. They thought they were in control. Festus thought he was in control. The tribe thought he was in control. Agrippa thinks he's in control. Caesar thinks he's in control. But what Paul already understood is what we just think. I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. And no matter who you stand me in front of, no matter who stands in front of me, I'm not going to back down. And I'm always going to preach Jesus. It's always going to be about the cross. Good day, bad day, terrible day, wonderful day. It's always going to be about Jesus. And so the journey that Paul was on was the journey he wanted to be on and the journey that God had called him to. Remember in 24, you have made your defense in Jerusalem, now go to Rome. And you see the divine appointments of God all along the way. Now let's jump in at 25 here. We left off from 24. Ends with the transition of the governorship of Felix to that of Festus. Right? We know that Felix wasn't a good guy. And so he lost his, historians tell us that he lost his governorship by violence and just really being out of control. And so we, here we are with Festus. It says, now three days after Festus had arrived in the province, he went up to Jerusalem from Caesarea. Now, three days lets us know that he's, he's trying to do what he's supposed to do. His duty is going to go over here. I'm going to check on, let me check on Homestead. Let me check on Brickle. Let me check on here. Let me check on, I'm checking it. This is my, my area of concern, right? I need to take care of them. So I'm going to go put my finger on the pulse of what's happening. And immediately made the trip to Jerusalem. This is probably the most important city in the province. Verse 2 says that the chief priest and the principal men of the Jews laid out their case against Paul. And they urged him, asking as a favor against Paul that he summon him to Jerusalem. Because they were planning an ambush to kill him on the way. Now if you'll go back, remember these are the same characters that took a vow not to eat until Paul was dead. That's how committed they were to seeing this man die. Like, can you imagine if I took 40 of us and said, listen, sorry, Fabian. <laughs> All right, guys, there's 40 of us. We're, let's not eat until we make sure that Fabian's dead. What kind of horrific activity is this? This is what was going on here. So I want to talk to you about a couple of things here. This is two years have passed. They had not let it go. 
bent as ever on destroying the Apostle Paul. Let me talk to you guys and bring this present, present right now for us. Do you know what happens when you hold on to bitterness like that? Do you know what happens? Do you think it destroys the person you're bitter against? It destroys you. You're holding on to it. Some of you are sitting here right now. As soon as I said that, you start thinking about that person. You are so mad at them. You started scheming in that conversation again. You know, you, you, you dream up these scenarios where you're having an argument with that person. Some of you lay in bed doing that. If they say this, then I'll say this. And then they'll come back and say this. And I'll be like, yeah, but this. And then, and, and then you got them in the end. And then you somehow go to sleep and sleep like garbage. Meanwhile, they're over there just resting. They don't care. They don't even know you're mad at them. And you're holding on to that root of bitterness. You are the one that suffers. You are the one that is miserable and dying inside. In fact, Scripture says in one version that you become defiled. Listen to this. Hebrews 12 says, pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Looking carefully lest any fall short of the grace of God. Lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble and by this, many become defiled. Defiled. You're dying. Inside. Some of you have let this root of bitterness get so deep inside of you, you're dying inside. And we walk in here week in, week out, like put on and slap on some band-aids and, and then walk out and just hate people. That's not, that's not okay. These, these were religious Leaders, but their, their, their actions here, as we unpack this, we look at this, this is a danger. This is, this is so evident that these guys weren't anywhere near God. Right? I mean, we look at this, these are the people scheming to kill somebody, taking vows not to eat, lying, cheating. Listen, if your religion makes you a liar and a murderer, something is wrong. That is not the religion of the Almighty. That is not the religion of Jehovah. Now, I know some of you are like, this is why religion is bad. No, religion is not bad. You've heard me say this a thousand times. Bad religion is bad. The religion that does this. The religion of this. But the Bible says what? Pure religion is this that you what? Care for the widows and the orphans. So if the Bible says there's pure religion... That tells me there's good religion. There's pure religion. Bad religion is bad religion. Pure religion is pure religion. Pure religion is that you actually demonstrate the work of God in your life, that the Holy Spirit power is coming out. You operate in the overflow of life. You are ministering like you're supposed to. Self-serving religion is never good. It's not good, and it's rough. And so you get to decide today if you're going to leave here bitter or not. If you're here just... To, to scratch something or check a mark off your list, you're, you're in the wrong place. I'm gonna ch I want to challenge you. I'm not, I'm not here to make you feel good. I'm here to preach the gospel to you. I'm here to, to get you as close. I don't need to make you disciples of me. I don't need you to be like me. I don't need you to, to make disciples of Life Point Church. I need to make disciples of Jesus, right? I'm trying to teach you how to pick up a spoon and, and feed yourself with the gospel every single day. Don't, don't tell me I'm not being fed. If you've been in a church for years, pick up a spoon and eat. Open up the word of God and eat. There's a feast there for you, right? It's not just Ezekiel said, I ate the scroll and it was sweet like honey, right? Now, I'm not saying chew on the word of God, but what I'm saying is, actually, some of you might chew on the word of God. I actually bit my Bible one time when I, when I was talking about that. But, but the, the, get this, he just, get it inside of you. It's nourishment. It's life. It will change you. It will challenge you. It will, it will fill your spirit, right? It, it isn't always like, oh, I read that, and it's just so much love, and it just comes over me. Sometimes I, I'm like, man, I got to, I need help. <laughs> you know what I mean? I just need a lot of help. Anybody need help in here from the Lord? Yeah, we need help, right? There's this. So you get to decide if you're going to become like these guys or not. And I don't care if you've been in the church for 150 years. You don't need this kind of attitude. The longer you've been in the church, the more you've grown up in the church, the lower you should stay. I told you this before. I'm always trying to be this way. I'm all, I want to be... Oh, you're the pastor of the church. I'm the chief servant of this place. Right? If 
I want you guys to worship, I should be the chief worshiper in this house, right? I want to be over here, I'm going to be worshiping. If I want you guys to pray, don't you think I should be praying? Don't you think I should model that? If I'm going to give, don't you think I should? If we're going to talk about generosity, don't you, don't you think we should do that? If I'm, I'm going to say read your Bible, don't you think? If I'm going to say carry a Bible, don't you think I should do this? I'm not saying do things that we don't do, it's, but it isn't about religion. It's, it's about discipleship that we're trying to get you on this path to. Now listen, 4 says, Festus replied that Paul was being kept at Caesarea and that he himself intended to go there shortly. So basically he refuses the request for a change of venue. This is very law-like, right? This is one, one way that God was divinely catering to Paul's path. It wasn't, Festus wasn't controlling anything. Five says, so he said, he let the men of authority among you go down with me. And if there is anything wrong about the man, let them bring charges against him. So he's saying it's okay to have another trial, even though there have been many trials already. But he said, this is not going to happen in Jerusalem. It will happen in Caesarea. Now, after he stayed there among them, not more than eight or ten days, he went down. Caesarea, on the next day, he took his seat on the tribunal and ordered Paul to be brought. So here he is on trial again. And when he arrived, the Jews who had come down from Jerusalem stood around him, bringing many and serious charges against him that they could not prove. Isn't this the case over and over again? They come just hurling accusations over and over again, zero evidence. He's already said, you told me I defiled the temple. I didn't defile the temple. You told me that I was inciting riots. I wasn't inciting riots. I wasn't doing any of this stuff, bringing it. Now, I want to tell you something. I don't think there's very many of you who have had a bunch of accusations against you for being a Christian. Maybe that people thought you were goofy or something like that. That's not persecution. Okay, so we're clear. It's not persecution. But this is something I believe that is going to increase rapidly in our society. If you are not going to have a backbone and a determination and you're not going to live with the Holy Spirit's power, you're going to be caught off guard. We're going to see, I want to take you on this journey real quick. It's always been here. We're talking about Paul. It's, it's gone through. And by the way, all over the world right now, there are people hiding their Bibles so they don't die. Right? There's people who are gathered in rooms. I've been in many of these rooms. Uh, they're not underground. Most of them, we call it the underground church, but they're, that's the persecuted church around the world that is happening. I mean, we, we were talking with a friend the other day. We were talking about the, the three fastest growing churches in the world are China, Afghanistan, and Iran. Places that people will get their heads cut off for carrying a Bible, right? This is the fastest growing church. So many in the Bible were targets of false accusations. Remember Joseph, he's in Potiphar's house. Remember that story, Potiphar's wife, she just really liked him. Apparently he was a good looking guy and she tried to chase him down, tried to tear off his clothes, right? He ran out of there like he should. By the way, young men, young women run from that kind of environment. But, but he, he was accused and ended up in the prison. Daniel, right, same situation as this, but, but there's a different agenda today. There's a different agenda coming our way. And like it or not, it's a sexual agenda. That they're trying to march. This is what Pastor Martin Sedra from Echo Church said is the religion of the day. And if you don't bow to the religion of the day, there will be persecution for you. Now, it's starting to rear its ugly head. It's going to happen more and more. I believe this. But here's, here's the problem. This is where I believe many will fail. They will fail because in trying to be helpful or not to offend somebody, right, or not to hurt people's feelings or this, that, or the other, they will back up. They won't stand firm, right, and they will fall. They will fall. They will fall and they will fail because they will bend their knee to someone who is not the Almighty. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. Feel that, that, that the weight of that. And he, here's why. How many of you know that the devil can't stop the church? You know that? The gates of hell will not prevail, right? So the, the devil cannot stop the church. So if he cannot stop the church, you know what he'll do? 
He'll put little seeds of stuff in there, and it will become apostate. Right? So little things, just because I don't want to share, I don't want to do this, I don't want to hurt. And so, oh, we want everybody to be comfortable. It's like, man, I just told you. Sometimes I read this, and I'm uncomfortable. I'm like, I, but he doesn't need to change. His word's not going to change. He's never changed. He's the one constant. Politicians will change. People will change. Issues will change. God will never change. His charge is the same yesterday, today, and forever. It's a call to holiness and a call to righteousness. So don't let those little seeds get in you. Because this is what the devil will try to do. He'll try to get in a church and he'll make it apostate. And in the end, when you re read Revelation, there's only two churches that keep their first love. That's it. The rest of me says, you have you failed to keep your first love. You failed. And this is a, a terrible, terrible thing. And when you get to heaven, we all know that there's only two options. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of thy master. Or depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. This is why Paul was so settled. Because he knew. He knew God. He knew that. And so when we, when we think of this and, and maybe we're like, well, I'm, I haven't really, I, I don't have any accusations against me. No, you just don't know it yet. Listen, very clearly, Revelation chapter 12, verse 10. I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, now the salvation and the power of the kingdom of God and the authority of his Christ have come. For who? For the accuser of our brothers. See, there's an accuser. His name is Satan. The devil, if you will, he's, he's going around like a, a lion, seeking who he can eat up, just with nonsense, right? But God's going to deal with him. That's what he said. He's been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before God. And they have covered him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. For they loved not their lives even unto death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in in them. So there is one who is going around trying to chew up everybody, accusing, lying, pushing against. He's going to be dealt with. He said, well, well, how do I deal with him? It tells you right there. By the blood of the lamb and the word of your testimony. And man, if you will just sit there like always going back to testimony and somebody like, well, I just don't have much to testify about. You're still alive. <laughs> You're still here. And on your very worst day, like, well, it's just, it's been the roughest day. Thank God for salvation. Thank God for the cross of Jesus Christ. On my best day, thank God for the cross of Jesus Christ. Again, on my mediocre day, thank God for Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for saving my life. Thankfully, Jesus is our defense against condemnation and false accusation. Everybody in this room has dealt with that at times. Everybody. Romans chapter 8, listen, verse 33. Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Listen, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword, jump down to 39, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Come on, church. What? Romans 8, one of, the, one of my favorite chapters. There is therefore now no condemnation. That's all the devil shows up with. He doesn't have anything new. He doesn't know what you're going to do, so he can't use that against you, right? He just knows what you've done, so he's always coming. He's always knocking on the door with the old stuff. Always. It's literally the same stuff every time. Every time. And so, as I've told you many times, when he comes knocking with shame and guilt and all that, and he's got all those accusations, you don't have to answer that door. Jesus already answered it. He already answered it. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That's how Romans chapter 8 starts. You know how it ends? I just read it to you. There is nothing that can separate you from the love of God. No condemnation and no separation. No condemnation, no separation. That's how Christ views us. Verse 8, listen. Paul argued in his defense, neither against the law of the Jews, nor against the temple, nor against Caesar, have I committed any offense. Paul is saying, I'm innocent. 
He's not hurling accusations. You're throwing stuff at me. I'm innocent. I know it, but this, this is not going to happen this way. And I said, but Festus, wishing to do the Jews a favor, politics, 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 said to Paul, do you wish to go up to Jerusalem and to be tried on these charges before me? And Paul said, I'm standing before Caesar's tribunal where I ought to be tried. To the Jews, I have done no wrong, as you know yourself very well. Ooh, now, he's, now he's putting it. He's like, you, you know. You know. This is one of my favorite things to say to people now when they, they know the gospel but they're not living right. I'll just look them dead in their eyes like, you know. <laughs> They'll look down. They're like, <laughs> they don't want to look at you when you hit them with that. Like, you know, because they know, right? He, says, he, he gets them with that. Verse 11 says, if then I am a wrongdoer and have committed anything for which I deserve to die, I do not seek to escape death. But if there is nothing to their charges against me, no one can give me up to them, and I appeal to Caesar. If essentially what he's doing is, I want to go to the Supreme Court. I'm not messing around with you guys. I want to go straight to the highest place in the land, and we're going to deal with this once and for all. Because he knew something. Again, he knew that his life was governed by God, not by these guys. He knew that. I'll see a victory. I don't care. I mean, you can stand me up. I'm not going to back down. I'm always going to preach Jesus. In fact, he wrote to the Romans. He had written this just a little earlier. Let 13 once said, let every person be subject to the governing authorities. This is powerful. For there is no authority except from God. And those that exist have been instituted by God. Isn't that feel good? Like sometimes you're like, man, the government's just doing this and this and my boss at work. Listen, God orders your steps. Not anybody else. You might feel like it's just so weighty and everybody's out to get me. And it might feel like that, but God has your back, right? He tells you nothing can steal you out of the hand of God. I don't care how much power they think they have. Nothing can steal you or pluck you out of the hand of God. He's got his hand of protection on you. Now, it's not hard to see as we read this after it's already happened that God's divine hand is touching Paul. It's not always easy, right? He's directing. He's directing all the way on the journey. He's preaching and teaching. And Paul, because I think because of his fullness, his overflow of power with the Holy Spirit, he knows. He has a supernatural understanding that God is ultimately in control. That feels good. And I know, like, young people... I was once young. I'm not now as young as I once was. <laughs> but as I get older, man, I just got to tell you, I'm just less attached to this world every single day. Right? Just less attached. I start thinking, oh, man. I, I joke around with my wife all the time. I'm like, I'm ready to go, babe. She's like, knock it off. <laughs> in, China, in, they, in China, they always go, pss, pss, pss. that means like, don't talk about it. All right, well, you're going to be better off. <laughs> this is going to be better off, you know. Probably retire and just kick back and not have to deal with me. That would be amazing. But here's the truth. God has an ultimate control of that. I don't care. I don't care what's coming my way from the world. But I very much care what's coming my way from God. Very, very detailed in my thought process about seeking after him. Matthew 6, seek first the kingdom of God and all these other things will be added. Instead of getting it backwards, like, oh, I'm going to seek this and this and this and this. This is why when people move away from home, they can't wait to get away from homestead. The first thing they go look at is the house. Then they look at schools. Then they look at the shopping in the neighborhood. And they don't even think about a church. You know how many emails we get from people going, we just can't find a place like Life Point? And, and like, I take that as praise God. Praise God for that. But that should have been the first thing on your list. That should have been secret. How are we going to get plugged in? How are we going to get into a connect group? How is this going to, like, how, where are we going to worship instead of, like, all the way down the bottom of the list? No wonder, no wonder you feel disconnected and out of place and out of sorts. Because you are, right? We need to get things in order. Paul had things in order. Then, verse 12, Festus, when he had conferred with his council, answered, 
To Caesar you have appealed, and Caesar you shall go. Which he had already been told. I'm going to tell Festus right to your face. I know. <laughs> Thanks for getting on with it, because I've known this for a while. Thanks for catching up. Now, what Paul probably did not know, or maybe knew, is that Nero was Caesar. And if you know anything about history, you know that Nero was a very very bad man. He made a sport out of killing Christians. I don't even want to go through all the details because it's so horrific in what he did. That's who Paul would have gone to. And maybe he had no reason at this time. Nero actually started, historians tell us, actually started decently, was surrounded by people, and it was just more about law, keeping order, doing the thing, and then somehow got it twisted after about four or five years and started just losing his mind. Really became totally anti Christian. Now we see something change here, and i got to burn through this real quick, so hang on tight. Verse 13 says, Now when some days had passed, Agrippa the king and Bernice arrived at Caesarea and greeted Festus. And as they stayed there for many days, Festus laid Paul's case before the king, saying, There is a man left prisoner by Felix. And when I was at Jerusalem, the chief priests and the elders of the Jews laid out their case against him, asking for a sentence of condemnation against him. Just for some historical context, King Agrippa's, King Herod Agrippa, he's got a long line of bad guys in his past. His grandfather had tried to kill Jesus as a baby, right? His grandfather had John the Baptist beheaded and his father had martyred the first apostle. So now Paul stands in front of this line of Herod's, Herod Agrippa mentioned in the second service that my dad years ago preached a sermon called the Herod Factor. Essentially what the premise of the message was this, is that there's always a Herod trying to take you out. It might not look like a person, it might be a thing or the devil himself, but there's always a Herod in your life you know, that's trying to do this. And you might have to flee to Egypt, Mary and Joseph fled to Egypt, or, you know, John the Baptist sent a letter to Jesus right before he died. Sometimes you, you, you might have doubt in your life. Jesus called John the Baptist the greatest man who ever lived. And right before they were going to cut his head off, he said, are you sure you're the one? <laughs> Jesus called him the greatest who ever lived. He just needed some certainty because they're going to cut my head off, man. Are you sure you're the guy? And you're like, I, be I believe, but help my unbelief, right? There's always a Herod. 16, he said, I answered them that it was not custom of the Romans to give up anyone before the accused met the accusers face to face and had the opportunity to make his defense concerning the charge laid against him. Now, Paul had already made his cheerful defense, right? And he's, Festus is breaking this down for King Agrippa because he wasn't there. The problem is Festus wasn't really there either. Felix was there. The tribune was there from before. So they're all kind of mixed up here. 17 says, when they came together, I made no delay, but on the next day, I took my seat on the tribunal, ordered the man to be brought. When the accusers stood up, they brought no charge in this case of such evils as I suppose. So they made their case against Paul, and Fess was like, I really didn't see anything that crazy. Rather, they had certain points of a dispute with him about their own religion. And this is my favorite line in the whole passage. And about a certain... Jesus, who was dead, but whom Paul asserted to be alive. If that is the tension from the people, can you imagine preaching so passionately about the cross of Jesus that it just threw the enemy into an uproar? This is, I mean, this is it. It's like I, all the other stuff they said against them, I really don't see any charges there. But, man, they were really concerned about their own religion and about a certain Jesus who apparently died but was totally alive. Paul wrecked these guys with the presentation of the gospel. He wrecked their heads. They couldn't stand it, right? And even with... Festus's limited knowledge, right, he, he understands something. So even as one who's not even a believer, the God, he's sending out the gospel. Watch what happens. Watch what happens. 
being at a, a loss on how to investigate these questions, I asked whether he wanted to go to Jerusalem and be tried there regarding them. But when Paul had appealed to be kept in custody for the decision of the emperor, I ordered him to be held until I could send him to Caesar. And then Agrippa said to Festus, now remember, this is the king. I would like to hear this man myself. <laughs> Tomorrow, said he, you will hear him. Now, the, the gospel has a grip. Agrippa's attention like why would this guy be on trial for talking about that that doesn't make any sense I'm curious you got my attention now we're going to hear the story Lord willing next week where Paul just presents the gospel to Agrippa in fact he gets him so twisted up you'll, you're going to see it. Agrippa's like you're about to get me bro <laughs> you're about to get me with this right so it says on the next day, Agrippa and Bernice came with great pomp. Of course they are. They're the king, the pomp, the circumstance. Let, let everybody know that I have arrived. And they entered in the audience hall with the military tribunes and the prominent men of the city. Then at the commands of Festus, Paul was brought in. And Festus said, King Agrippa and all who are present with us, you see this man about whom the whole Jewish people petitioned me both in Jerusalem and here, shouting that he ought not to live any longer, but I found that he had done nothing deserving death. And as he himself appealed to the emperor, I decided to go ahead and send him, but I have nothing definite to write to my Lord about him. Therefore, I have brought him before you all, and especially before you, King Agrippa, so that after we have examined him, I might have something to write, for it seems to me unreasonable in sending a prisoner not to indicate the charges against him. Festus didn't even have anything to write. <laughs> Listen, there's going to be a lot of accusations that come your way. If you're, going to, if you're going to stand for the Lord, if you're going to make your line and choose you this day whom you will serve, if you're going to choose Jesus, get ready for it. Jesus told his disciples if they, if they, they hated you, they hated me first. <laughs> oh, you thought you were the only one who was hated? They hated. They killed me. They hung me on a cross. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart. I've overcome the world, right? Jesus was trying to get them to understand it. I'm trying to get you to understand it. But check this out. In the end, it doesn't matter. God's taking care of all the accusations. He's taking care of all the slander. I don't, I'm not going to fight that battle with you. probably heard me say this before people are going to hurl accusations one way I like to say this people are going to they're going to shoot at you don't hand them a loaded gun stand with me real quick but I want to I want to clarify something to you here's what I mean by that how many of you have some church hurt in your life anybody look at that look around real quick just hold up your hand if you got a little bit of church in there see there's people Welcome to the club. I've been in church my whole life. You want to you match stories? I can match them with you. Or you can say, I ain't holding on to that. Because I wasn't trying to serve those people anyway. They weren't trying to serve me either. We just somehow got our focus all mixed up. I'm sorry for that stuff that happened to you in church. See, the thing is, sometimes we think like people are going to be different inside of church and outside of church. And we should be but we're just people. Inside here, we call them sheep, right? Not sheep like we don't know what's going on, but that's what he calls us, sheep. But sheep bite. They bite. That's what they do. If you hang around them long enough and you stick your hand in there, you're going to get bit. They're sheep. That's what happens. This is why we need a Savior. This is why we need help. We need the Holy Spirit operating inside of us so that he'll help us love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control because on their own sheep really aren't any of that and all of the negative attention the church has gotten over the years I think maybe not always I don't like picking on the church much I say maybe maybe we've we've given the world a gun to shoot at us We've loaded it for them, right? Oh, you go to church? It's just full of what? So you know. The 
I love Jesus with all my heart, all my strength, all my soul, all my mind. I love him with everything. But it's Friday, and I really love Fridays. Shoot at our church. What if, check this out, what if we really know God? And we start living in such a manner that it starts flipping the script on everybody who has this preconceived notion that every, everybody in church is a hypocrite, which we are, right? So are they. Um, but, like, what if we start flipping it? And, and the first thing that when you mention church to somebody, the first thing isn't that they're hypocrites, but the first thing they start thinking about is, man, church people, they're such servants. They're so kind. They're so loving. They're so welcoming. They're so generous. They're always talking about Jesus all the time. It's just, and they, they demonstrate, it seems to line up. They seem to do the things that they talk about. What if, what if that becomes the reality? That becomes this, but we've not done a great job sometimes of doing that. Now, we're not perfect. That's why we need a Savior. But I am committed this next season to be an authentic church that demonstrates the love of Jesus in a real way. And if we do that, the gospel will advance. People will meet Jesus. Their lives will be changed. Is it messy? Of course it's messy. Discipleship is messy. It's messy. But I'm committed present Jesus in a way that really grabs people. I mean, grabs them. Festus was presenting Jesus before Paul even gets to Agrippa. Agrippa's like, what's this about? I want to see this guy. Some of you are going to be presenting to your friends and they don't believe you yet and they're going to go like, man, Jamel is just always talking about Jesus. I'm like, well, I want to hang out with Jamel. I'm curious about this Jesus because I see how his life is moving and he seems to be doing pretty good and, and seems anchored and, and, and put together and I want some order in my life. Not everything is super hyper spiritual. Some things are very practical because if we're going to live a life of firmness, of stability, anchored in Jesus, when the whole world is shaking and it's going to shake, Right? Abraham, when he went walking, Hebrews tells us that he went looking for a city whose foundation is the Lord's. If you want a foundation of the Lord's, I will build my life upon you. I will build it. You can sing it or you can do it. Or you can do it and sing it as a testimony because we will overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. Would you bow your heads with me today? job at living life for you. But we didn't get it all wrong, God. You helped us to get some things right. So I want to say thank you for helping us to get some things right. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for convicting where necessary. Thank you for leading. Thank you for changing. God, it's not by power, nor by might, but by your spirit speaking today. You are changing our hearts. You are transforming in here. You're renewing. You are filling. You are shaping. You are molding. You are making. I even believe that you are imparting into people right now a missionary spirit, a prophetic spirit, a pastoral calling right now.
God, help us to live you out. I just want to live you out, God. Holy Spirit, direct us. Lead us. Empty us of ourselves. Save us from ourselves, God. are in your hands, Lord. It's the best place for it. Pray this prayer with me, church. I believe in my heart and I confess with my mouth that you are my Lord and Savior. Thank you for saving me. Now be my Lord. Convict me when necessary, God. Help me to stay on your path of righteousness. Help me to live for you with everything. Thank you. Father, thank you for this time. We thank you for everybody in the room. It's not by accident that they're here. I'm so thrilled that we get to do this. We are excited about this next season. I pray that the heart of Homestead and the hearts in Homestead will be transformed by your love and grace. Help us shine for you. We love you, we honor and bless you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Can we put our hands together, church? <laughs> Two things. One, next week back to school blessing. Bring everybody. We're going to fill it up. It's going to be amazing. And the second thing is this. I love you guys. I'm excited about you. Nobody tells you that. You're like, you don't even know me. Yeah, but the Holy Spirit does, and I know him, so we're good. We got a network. It's good. I'm excited about you. I'm excited how God's going to use you in this next season to reach people. I love you guys. We always pray our benediction here. Psalm 1914. Let's do it together. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Love you guys.